Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak here. I would like to apologize because my voice is a bit hoarse. I'm coming from a cold, so maybe at some point I have to mute myself to cough a bit. So I apologize in advance for whatever may happen during the talk. But if for whatever reason you cannot understand me or my voice gets in the way, please stop me and make me repeat things whenever necessary. And OK. So I'm going to talk about the continuous formulation of two layer or single hidden layer neural networks as Wasserstein, Wasserstein type gradient flows. And this is going to be mostly a talk, uh, an expository talk. So I'm not going to introduce new results. I'm going to, to give a, a way to see uh, neural networks from a, an analytic point of view, from a, the point of view of a mathematician. So it's going to be very elementary. And this talk, from my point of view, is aimed at mathematicians, but hopefully is accessible to anyone who wants it. But I will start very basic. So let me start fixing notations. So I start simply saying what I'm trying to do when I try to train a neural network. Everyone knows that, especially in this type of conferences. But in this way, I can fix my notations. So when we have a neural network, we try to approximate a, a function f in a domain Rd. And we, we are trying to approximate this function f with functions defined in this way, that is functions that are parameterized by this set of parameters that I'm going to be calling wi and theta i. And later I will change the notation again, so I will try to be consistent all the time. But basically, we're trying to approximate with groups of n things of this form. So we have some weights wi, some activation function sigma, and some farther weights theta i. wi lives in r, theta i lives in rd, to keep uh, the notation on our minds all the time. And usually we approximate wi and theta i in pairs. And when I say that we are approximating uh, a function, a given function, that for me in this problem, f is going to be a given thing. So I don't care what f looks like. So I don't care about the second part of this type of training of neural networks. For me, f is a given parameter of the program. And when we try to approximate these f's, I have to tell you a, a metric in which we approximate in this case, we, are, we, we have to choose an expected loss that for me is going to be the simplest possible model, which is just the L2 loss. But this can be chosen, adapted to the task we have in mind. So basically, mathematically, we choose the parameters wi, theta i, such that this fn is the best approximation if in f in this L2 metric. Uh, so this is just reformulating the same thing I was saying before. Hn is for me going to be the space of functions that can be parameterized with n parameters of this form. I say n parameters, but when I say n parameters, I mean n pairs. So it's n neurons, n pairs, wi, to die. And typically, when we have this type of problem, what, what is done in, in practice is you perform a stochastic gradient descent of the set of parameters. And you start from an initial value that you choose in different ways, but you start from an initial value. So you have an initial approximation fn0 that has nothing to do with f. And then you, you choose the parameters and you start doing a gradient descent of the parameters so that this integral here converges to, a, to something. And the goal or the hope is that whatever fn is converging to is, is actually something reasonable. And this is pretty much the good thing about training a neural network. And one of the big questions about uh, in optimal transport is, how reasonable is really this approximation? And when we do this procedure in the training of the parameters, when we do a gradient descent, how reasonable is it to expect that this training is giving us uh, a good approximation of f? No, and this is a question because a priori, this functional on the space of parameters, which is what we are trying to approximate, is very heavily non-convex. So, so there's no reason to believe a priori from a mathematical point of view that to believe that if you start from an arbitrary set of parameters, when you do a gradient descent, you're actually converging to something reasonable. That is something that approximates f in a reasonable way. So let me reformulate the problem. I'm going to state exactly the same problem, but from a measure point of view. So I'm going to use measures to state exactly the same problem, which seem like a more consistent, a more rigid object to 
I'm sorry, a more flexible object to, to play in this setting. And so we have some Fn that is going to be of this form. So Fn is just the sum of n pairs of parameters that you write it i. And we can think of the structure of the neural network, a typical structure that people represent. So for input in Rd, we have an output y, which is the sum of this n. Sorry, I have to divide by n here because I'm assuming this has size one. And here we have what I call the n neurons. And each neuron corresponds to one pair wi in R, theta i in Rd, not in Rd plus one. So I associate to each neuron one value that it's chi i, which is a value in Rd plus one which is one pair wi theta i. So for me, chi is going to be the variable in, in this talk. Chi is just the pair w theta, where w lives in r and theta lives in rd. And then we define this, which is also given from the problem, this function phi of chi x, which is just w sigma theta x. So it's the elements, the elements I'm, I'm adding up here. So, <coughs> sorry. So, we can identify each neuron with a parameter now. So you see this problem, I don't care the situation, the position the neurons are in, it's very under, under permutations of problem. So I can identify each neuron directly with a parameter chi i. And, and more precisely, what I can say is that I can identify each neuron with an atomic measure with an atom in chi i in the space of parameters. So this is what I do. I identify each neuron with a measure that's going to put me a delta where the parameter corresponding to the neuron and then I can rewrite my function fn instead of being a function, I'm sorry, instead of seeing it as a function in this way, I see it as a convolution of an empirical measure uh, defined on the set of all the parameters that define fn convoluted against some function that is fixed given by the problem. So phi here is a smooth function given by the problem, both in g and x, and mu n is the empirical measure of the set of parameters that in this case, uh, characterize fully the, the neural network of one single hidden member. So I have some fn associated to mu n, but I'm not saying anything. I'm just reformulating things in a different language, but I'm not saying anything new. So what I said is just for each function fn, I have associated a measure mu n, and now mu n contains in itself the invariance under permutations of the parameters. So uh, this object fn, I don't need to define any variance on permutations for the parameters, mu n already contains this information. And not only that, if I know a priori other symmetries of the problem, it's easier to include them in mu n than in fn. And in the same way that I have, uh, before I told you that when we train a neural network, we have some fn that we start with and then we do a, a gradient descent. And we have an evolution of parameters, which also means an evolution of approximating functions that converge to something. In the same way, given a, an initial measure mu n, that is an initialization of the parameters, I have the corresponding initial measure. I also have an evolution of measures mu n t. And this evolution of measure mu n t is a full characterization of what it means to train a neural network. As you see, I'm always assuming that the time is a continuous variable for me. So uh, mu n t is going to be the evolution and just observe that mu nt is the evolution. So it's, it's a curve in the space of measures that started with n atoms and preserves being atomic with n atoms all the time. Maybe two atoms join, but it's always atomic with n atoms or less. Uh, and the good thing about this different, slightly different formulation in terms of measures instead of functions is that when I take enough atoms, when I take n large enough, mu n is actually, or any probability measure can actually be approximated by n atoms for n large enough. Or let's say that uh, an arbitrary measure can be approximated by atomic measures weakly. I just need to take enough atoms. So this suggests that maybe we can see the functions f instead of being represented by an associated function fn by a measure mu n, if n is large enough, I could maybe reformulate that problem instead in terms of measures directly. So what I'm going to do is exactly that. Instead of considering functions fn given by n, n parameters, I consider the functions f parameterized by measures, by probability measures in this way. So from now on, these, these are my candidates. These are the things that I want to train is convolutions of a measure mu against a, a smooth function of g and x. And this is the problem I was dealing with before. And this is the problem I have to deal with now, which is the, the expected loss. 
So I have to minimize the expected loss of this functional, but now this functional, instead of being a functional on the set of parameters, now is a functional on the space of measures. Alternatively, before it was a functional defined on the space of, of n atomic measures, now I'm saying define it for any measure. Doesn't matter if it's n atomic or not. Now I have a functional in the space of measures. So our goal, when we are trying to train a neural network, if we forget about the distinction of being n atomic or being a probability measure, I'm saying that they are roughly equivalent. Intuitively, our goal is to minimize this functional in the space of measures. And this is, this is equivalent to the previous problem up to this consideration. And more generally, what we, we, what we will do is we minimize the same functional as before, but we add this regularization term, this very typical regularization term. One can think of V as just being the, uh, the kinetic energy or just you put an exponent two or an exponent one, I don't care. But this is the typical functional that one minimizes when one tries to train a neural network. And I want to emphasize that so, how, so far I haven't said anything new. So I'm just reformulating the previous problem in a different language. And I'm just using this fancy language to say that the previous problem can actually be rewritten in terms of measures in this way. But I'm, I'm not adding new information. I'm just saying that this is a nicer way to write the previous problem. But in this way, it's easier, it's easier at least for me to believe that uh, it's now reasonable to find, to, to produce a minimizer by computing the gradient descent of this functional on me. At least it's more reasonable because I kind of believe that this functional has more structure than the one before because this functional in terms of, with respect to the linear structure of measures, th this functional is actually convex. Later, it will not matter that this is convex with respect to this linear structure, but at least this shows that I, I can see clearly now that this function will have a unique minimizer at least when seen under phi. So this, there, there will only be one approximating function that will minimize this. So this function a priori has better properties than the previous one while I'm actually not doing anything. I'm just rewriting it in terms of a new measure. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to do what I was doing before, uh, before I was doing a stochastic gradient descent. So now I want to say, how do I minimize a functional in the space of measures? So in two slides, I'm going to very briefly describe how one minimizes a functional in the space of measures or what one can do. This is probably well known by many people, but I'm doing these two slides for this one. Uh, so what I'm going to define is what's a gradient flow in a metric space. And then I'm telling you what the metric space I'm choosing is in this case. So uh, how do we do? a gradient descent in the space of measures, or more generally, how do we do a gradient descent in a metric space? Well, this is now more standard, but it's a, a very nice idea, which is generating something called the minimizing movement scheme of a functional. So let me assume that F is a functional with as many nice properties as I want. Then for any starting point in a metric space M, I can generate a sequence of points indexed by K for a given step size tau in this way. So starting from row zero, I can generate row k plus one from row k, finding the minimizer of this functional of, that's the functional of row now. Why is this a reasonable sequence? Well, if you think in the Euclidean case, finding the, the, the condition that row k plus one is a minimizer of this functional here, implies in particular that the gradient of f at row k plus one plus the gradient of the distance squared, which in the Euclidean case is just the difference divided by tau is zero. So what I'm saying that row k plus one belongs to this, it's the arc mean of this, of this functional here. In the Euclidean case, what I'm saying is that row k plus one is like a solution to the implicit Euler scheme uh, of F. So I'm actually in, in, the, in the Euclidean case doing this construction, what I'm actually doing is I'm doing a gradient descent. For a general metric space, this is the corresponding natural definition of gradient descent or gradient flow. Uh, well, the, the correct one is when you let the step size go to zero and now you create a curve, you end up obtaining a curve in the, in the metric space M, that what it's doing is it has the nice properties that it's trying to go to lower values of F at least. And this is what I call uh, the gradient flow in this context. And what I want to emphasize, I can define this whenever F is in a metric space. Then maybe I need further properties in F to ensure that these, the things converge. 
But the definition, at least point-wise definition, makes sense when f is in a metric space. And in our case, we were in the space of measures. So we need to put a metric in that space in order to produce a gradient flow that allow me to do a gradient descent in the space of measures so that I can do the gradient flow of that functional. And in this case, it's very standard. Uh, I think especially uh, in the last years in the machine learning community, it's also been very much used. I'm choosing the Wasserstein to distance, which is very natural in the space of measures, which is also the earth mover distance. And it's a, a very natural distance also mathematically because it's, it's a distance that metrizes the weak convergence of measures. And in particular, once I have the Wasserstein distance, which roughly speaking says, what's the minimum, what's the minimum cost to transport a certain measure to another measure given a cost function? So in this case, my cost function is going to be the square cost function. Um, so now that we have a distance in the space of measures, there's a natural way to define a gradient flow in the space of measures. So we have a Wasserstein gradient flow. So we have a way on the previous function I was telling you, we have a way to minimize the functional, a natural way to minimize the functional or produce a, a gradient descent in the space of measures rather than in the discrete case. And the question now is, or the question that anyone should have at this point would be, what's the consistency between the two problems? We had a discrete problem, we had a continuous problem. Are they consistent between them? And this is basically, the answer is yes, they are consistent, but we don't know everything yet. So the first observation is that minimizing the functional uh, among the set of atomic measures with n atoms is very similar to minimizing the functional among all probability measures. This is very reasonable, but this is to say that if you have a minimizer for one, you probably have a minimizer for the other. And the more atoms you put, the better the, this approximation is. Uh, the second observation is that, at least mathematically, this is trivial, but it's that when you do the Wasserstein gradient flow in the space of measures of the function f, that you initialize the gradient flow with an, with an atomic measure with n atoms, you are actually obtaining the gradient descent of the original problem. So by defining this new notion of Wasserstein gradient flow, when I restrict myself to the space of measures with n atoms, I'm actually not saying anything new. I'm saying we do exactly the same thing as before. The gradient descent is the same as before. Everything is exactly the same. And then there's the further consistency results in this direction that are very recent. Let's say, let's say for example, that uh, we know that any measure can, approximate, can be approximated by atomic measures, but this also happens at the level of the, of the gradient flow. So if I, for finite times, taking the, the, the gradient descent of an atomic measure will converge to the gradient flow of the corresponding limiting measure for finite times. So the two problems are consistent with each other. I don't care if I'm minimizing uh, with atomic measures or with just full measures. There's some consistency and the problems, I don't know if someone has something. Okay. And um, okay, uh, so these are known results, but that now there start to be some results that are not so well known. So when we try to train a neural network, what we try, what we're interested in actually is what happens. We, we try to prove some consistency in the, in the limiting value. So we want the measure, the limiting measure in the discrete case and in the continuous case to be uh, close enough to each other. So what I said, it's for finite times for when you let t go to infinity, now it's not so clear that they converge to the same value, but a result of Chisa and Bach from also very recent, it's a very, very nice paper and very well-known paper, says that under reasonable assumptions, if you assume that the initial atomic measure you put is uniform enough, and if you assume certain activation functions, that is homogeneous activation functions, in these situations, you also get that uh, in, the limit, in the limit when t goes to infinity, both the continuous formulation and discrete formulation uh, are giving the same result. So under cer certain assumptions, this limit is also true, but this is still an open question for other assumptions, uh, sorry, in other situations. So, so far I just told you, I, I just basically spent the whole talk uh, saying that there's this other interpretation of the same problem, but they haven't offered anything new. So let me offer you at least why it's interesting to study this problem from a, an analytic point of view, from a mathematical point of view. Uh, it's because 
we have a closed form to describe the evolution of the gradient descent in terms of a PDE for the continuous formulation. So the, the gradient descent for, uh, for the discrete version, it's, it's very explicit, but it's, it's very complicated. It's heavily non-trivial. But the gradient descent for, or the, gradient, the Wasserstein gradient flow for the function can be, can be, all the information can be summarized in the evolution of this PDE. So when we try to, when we try to produce a Wasserstein gradient flow of F, uh, we expect some curve that's going to start from an initial an initialization of the parameters. And this curve is going to satisfy this parabolic PDE. And this parabolic PDE is the standard variation uh, the Wasserstein variation of f, and here df d mu for me is going to denote the external variation of f, so the variation with respect to l2. Now I'm going to explicitly write it. What I mean is that I have a PDE that describes explicitly the evolution of the parameters in the training of a neural network, at least in a continuous formulation. Good thing about this PDE, what we are doing a Wasserstein gradient flow, so the PDE is dissipative, which means that the energy decreases along the path. And just let me write more explicitly the PDE. We have some functional f. This was my functional from before. Alternatively, I can write it like that, where I have to tell you what these kernel is and these terms are. The, it, these are just given functions. So we have some kernel, some quadratic term that involves mu twice. It's a kernel involving the activation function. So this is just a function phi. And s is going to be uh, a vector that is also given by the program in terms of f, which for me was a parameter, and again, the activation function. And then I have an evolution, uh, uh, a PD, whose evolution describes exactly the training of a neural network in a continuous formulation. So I have that the mu is the divergence of mu t times the gradient of this convolution term, which is the convolution of this kernel against a mu, and then a transport term where I have the divergence of mu and, and some vector field. Um, the, this is a nice structure. This is the convolution of, of this kernel. And this kernel is symmetric, and this kernel is positive semi-definite. Definite. And this PD, at least one would think that the PD community, we could deal with it easier than in the previous setting. Or at least we can start using the, the toolbox of PDs to try to study it and try to derive properties of solutions to this PD. So, the questions for us or for mathematicians in this context is, is it true that solutions to this PD always converge when t goes to infinity? And more precisely, under which conditions do they converge? You see, we don't expect solutions to always converge to the same thing clearly. For example, just for the simple reason that whenever you have a measure with n atoms, the structure of having n atoms is always preserved. But it's not clear, for example, if a smooth solution can produce atoms along the sequence or if something weird can happen in this direction. So under reasonable assumptions, do solutions to this converge to a minimizer? And if so, what are those reasonable assumptions? So there's these assumptions of Shizabach that say that under some uniformity assumptions, you converge to a minimizer. And these assumptions involve this uniformity condition on the initial value, but they also involve uh, certain activation functions that are homogeneous. Can we say in general, there's, there's a, there's a, is there a, stronger assumption why solutions should converge to a minimizer under reasonable assumptions. Uh, and what are these minimal assumptions? And perhaps more interestingly, at least for me, is how fast are we converging? So if we already know that mu t is very close to a minimizer or very close to a stationary solution, is there any way to establish a rate of convergence to this stationary, so, a stationary solution? Uh, you see, th this problem, I told you it was convex with respect to the linear structure of measures, but it's not convex with respect to the Wasserstein distance. So th there's not this non-degeneracy that would force me to have exponential rate of convergence. So I don't have any notion of how it should converge. I have absolutely no idea what the rate of convergence should be, or even under which circumstances I should expect it to have it. And just to finish, these previous questions that I've put for this PDE, from a mathematical point of view, but also in practice, what people do or what people can do is, okay, maybe I don't know it for this PD, but let me regularize it a bit. Let me add an extra term that makes this PD nicer. So one way to do that is in the, at the level of the functional, let me add either an entropy or the integral of the, of the measure square. And this, what it's doing is, is forcing the solution to be 
it is immediately smooth because you need the entropy uh, or the square to be immediately defined. So this is at the level of the PD. This is what, what this is really doing is adding a diffusion term at the PD or adding a porous medium regularization on, on in this other case. At the level of the stochastic gradient descent, this is like, it's like adding a small white noise at each step. And what this is forcing is forcing the solution to be, in this case, is forcing the solution to be uh, immediately smooth and with full support. And in this case, it's forcing the solution to be immediately smooth and with support that will go to be full when time goes to infinity. And in this case, the nice thing is that once you add digital colorization, now you can prove that stationary solutions are unique. However, even with this extra regularization, we are still at a loss when uh, regarding what happens for the rate of convergence. So now we expect the solution to converge to a minimizer, to the unique stationary solution, to the unique minimizer, but we still have no idea. Like one would intuitively say that this should force an exponential rate of conversion that maybe it depends on tau, but as far as I know, no explicit rate of convergence has been shown so far. And this is everything I wanted to say, so thank you very much. The mic is open now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, there are uh, questions or comments? Yes. Can you hear me? Xavi, can you hear us? I can hear you, yes. So, no, my question is at the beginning, right? The loss function was defined as an n2 norm, right? And I understand you know the derivation of all the uh, method is quite complex. So uh, I mean, if you check the loss function, I mean it's, and, and perhaps this is something you've already thought about it. What is the impact of changing the loss function to the uh, derivation? I'm not here the second part of the question. Okay. It's about what is the impact of changing the norm. The impact of changing the norm in the loss function. In the loss function. Ah, um, it's, if you put reasonable loss functions, you should get like it, it might not be as nice, but we still we still get a PD. So uh, this is the only thing I'm saying in the end, no? that we get a PD and whose evolution we want to study. If you change the norm instead of putting the L2 norm, you put a, you put another norm, you still get a reasonable PD, and what I'm saying still applies, except that the PD is going to be different, but. It, it can be computed explicitly and it's not difficult. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And other questions or comments? Uh, I, I have a, a, a quick uh, question about the, la the last comment that you had in your last slide. Uh, that is uh, about the explicit rate of convergence. That is kind of a, that that is a, an intuitive meaning of how fast the network converges to a final solution. So, do you, do you think that there is some hope of getting estimates of the rate of convergence without being able to write explicitly the diffusion equation because Writing explicitly the diffusion equation looks like an impossible task because it depends on the data set, right? While uh, the, the, the rate of convergence, on the other hand, do you think that there is some hope to, to get explicit rate of convergence from this uh, formalism? From this PD, in terms of tau, you mean? Pardon? In terms of the, an explicit rate of convergence to the unique minimizer for this PD, and the rate of conversions depending on tau, I don't see any reason why not. And if I'm completely honest, it could be that it has been done in the last two months and I don't know about it because I don't think we are too far from that. Okay, but I, I, I mean, you, you are saying that, that with the, 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 the additional uh, regularization with term, with the regularization term, you, you, you think you could get a rate of convergence that depends that is. Yes. Dependent on the regularization term. I say that it's reasonable, but it's possible, yes. Okay. 
So without the, the regularization term, so with just considering the, 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 the main structure of the net, the, the loss function. Without the regularization term, I, I, I'm not even sure what the right way to formulate the problem is, if I'm honest. I see. No, no, it's, it's the, everything is still very open. You see, well, yes. Okay. I think there should be a natural way to do it. I, I cannot say. I, I cannot say that I know. Which, I know which one it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much.